Many of you know that uh, we were missionaries in Budapest, Hungary um, for five years, six years, whatever. And uh, we worked with a pastor by the name of Greg. His name is Greg Opeen. And at one point, our church was growing. The church was growing. When we got there, it was a Bible study of 20. And, you know, we saw it go to 100. And we saw it go to 200. And then it was like, man, um, you know, we saw it kind of grow almost to 400. This is over four years. It was just, like, amazing. And we're like, we need our own building. And so we began to scope out and search for a building in Budapest. Now, our friend Greg, he was a visionary. So he could walk up on into a building that was literally falling apart, dilapidated, and he could see with vision what it could be. And I would just sit there, and he'd be telling me, oh, yeah, you could have the sanctuary over here. We'll have some beams coming here. And then, you know, this could be where the kids miss you. And you're just sitting there going, like, what are you talking about? Like, I just couldn't see it. And, and there's people with vision. Um, I, I admire builders. I admire someone that can just, uh, there's an empty space or, or whatever, and they can just, in their mind, see what it can become. Um, I don't necessarily have, you know, that that gift, um, but builders are amazing. They can see uh, an empty space and see the, the possibilities. Now, when we started at First Peter, I told you about this architectural wonder, uh, if we could call it that, in Italy. Okay? It's called the Leaning Tower of Pisa. And the thing is, this thing is famous, not because of its height. It's only 179 feet tall, and not because of its architecture. It's Romanesque, but um, I mean, it, it, it's a great study in that. That's not why it's famous. It's famous, why? Because it leans, okay? And um, they had projected that at some point it would fall over, okay? And so it was constructed in 1173, and they say it falls at the rate of 1 20th of an inch um, every single year. So every 20 years, it shifts an inch, which doesn't seem like a lot, but if you're going back to 1173, over time, you know, it, that's why it's, it's leaning. Um, right now, it's presently 17 feet or so out of plumb. You know, the plumb line, the straight, it's 17 feet uh, out of plumb. Now, I have a question for us as we kind of get started in Second Peter. Do you want your life to represent some let's call it freaky tourist attraction that's leaning, or do you want your life to represent something solid that's helpful and beneficial and permanent? I think if we're honest, we would choose the latter. Now, those are kind of Peter's thoughts as he starts this book of Second Peter. It's all about growth. Okay? He, he's speaking to an audience, and he's teaching and developing from that. Now, Second Peter is a little bit different than First Peter. First Peter, he was concerned uh, heavily about the dangers from the outside, persecution, suffering, oppression. But in Second Peter, he's actually more concerned about dangers um, really from, from the inside in terms of like deception and false teaching. But at the very core where he starts kind of in this chapter, um, it's all about spiritual growth. Now, we've heard that term a bunch of times. Hey, are you growing spiritually? Spiritual growth. And so he's just going to launch in, and we're just going to look at the first 11 verses today. So I'm going to read those, and we're going to go back and just pick them apart and hopefully get out of here with some kind of uh, sense of what he's saying and some nuggets to hold on to. So 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, and he says this, Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us, by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which, you have, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through, the, through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For if these things are yours 
and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted, even to blindness, and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure, for if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let me ask you a question. Are you growing up or are you just growing old? Okay. It's a good question to ask yourself from time to time. We all are growing older. Let's, I mean, we know that. Every day we grow older. But are we growing up? Are we growing stronger? Are we just growing old? Because we know that growth is a normal part of life. Whenever there's birth, there's growth. There's been some new uh, babies born within, you know, our, our fellowship. And it's just amazing how just over a few months, man, there's growth. And you're just like, wow, they're changing so quickly. And um, when we have children, as parents, we're, we're often willing to put up with the noise. We're willing to put up with um, the messes and all of those things that are a part of babyhood, I would say. Why? Because we're aiming for getting that child to mature and, and enter into adulthood. And, and we mark that growth okay, as we um, celebrate birthdays. My, my son Noah just had um, his birthday this week. He turned 15. But I remember back to the, the house. Um, my, my parents just sold a house and moved to Knoxville. But the house that they lived in previously is where I kind of spent from um, year five through I graduated high school. And next to the back sliding glass door, there was a, a space of wall. And my dad began to mark us. You know, every, every so often he would say, all right, shoes off, you know, back up, you know. And, and he would take a, a ruler and he would make a little line and he would say, Mike, you know, um, June 1985. And, you know, he, he did that. And so when, when they left that house, you know, all, there was all these lines there from my brother and I. And, and we were keeping track uh, of growth. It was tracking our progress. Well... The Christian life begins with birth, being born again. That's what Jesus said. You must be born again. But guess what? That's not the end. It's not like, hey, someone prayed a prayer. Someone came forward, and they got saved. And so now, yay, it's over. No, guys, that's just the beginning. Like, that's a great day, but that's not the end. A lot of people treat it as the end. Oh, okay, I'm in. <laughs> I'm saved. And they just kind of like, that, that, that's it. But no, 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 that's just... The beginning, we want to grow, we want to develop, we want to blossom, and we want to mature. And so as we go through this section, that's really what Peter is laying out here in these 11 verses, okay? And so I want to give us basically four prerequisites to building an everlasting faith, okay? And I'll talk about those in just a moment. But, but, but there's two overarching general principles about growth that you need to understand um, that you need to understand about spiritual growth. Number one, your spiritual growth has nothing to do with your physical age. Your spiritual growth has zero to do, really, with your physical age. You can be an older person and actually a spiritual infant. Charles Spurgeon said it this way. He said, there are children in the church of God who are 70 years old. But he also said, on the other hand, there are wise and instructed and stable folk who are relatively young. So, spirit, so physical age and spiritual maturity aren't necessarily equal. That's the first principle. The second principle that we need to lay out, you can grow spiritually as much as you want to grow. You can grow as much as you want to grow. And so that really brings us to the central theme that Peter's getting at, the secret of using what God has provided. Okay? I mean, he, he gives his little introduction, Simon Peter, Bonser, and we talked about that um, as we got into uh, First Peter. So uh, I'm not going to belabor that because I think we want to get to really um, the crux of, of what these verses are. But he's, he's writing, he says, and he's not writing to the Jews that are dispersed or to a certain region. He just says, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. To those who have obtained like precious faith. That's who he's writing to. 
Now, um, once you have the faith that he gives you, it's a gift. Okay? You obtain like precious faith. That's verses 1 and 2. Then you must grow in that faith. That's what we see really in verses 3 through 11. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at our life, okay, your life, the Christian life, as building a structure, building a forever faith. There's four prerequisites that you um, need to build it. Number one, you have to have the right investor, okay, if you're going to build something. You've got to find someone who's going to bankroll the project. And guess what? We have God as the investor, and that's great news. You know why? Because he has unlimited resources. Okay? It all begins with God. He first gives the gift of salvation. Someone gets saved, it's not like, oh, I, you hear this, I found God. No, that's not accurate. He actually found you. He revealed himself to you. He called you. He sent his Holy Spirit to bring that conviction. It's not like, oh, God was lost and I found him. No, you were lost and he found you. So salvation begins with God. But he has two things that are important. Guess what? God has power and he has promises. Okay? Look at verse 3. I mean, he, when he, when he well, go back to verse 2, he says grace and peace. And this is just his way of, of introducing, okay? Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and Jesus Christ the Lord. And that's what he's wanting. He's praying, man, grace for you. Peace. I mean, be multiplied. It's like just more and more and more. And you know how that happens? You know how you obtain more grace and more peace? As you know God more. That's what he says. Okay? In the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ the Lord. Now, when we get to verse 3, um, we're going to begin to see his promises. Notice he says, As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. Honestly, I could just give a sermon just on that verse and give many for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. I'm not going to do that because we want to go through the whole book. But there is so much wrapped up just in that verse. Have you thought about what divine power can do? Think about God's power. Because we always think it like how, what we can do. And guess what? We're very limited in what we can actually do. God is unlimited. So what can divine power do? Divine power can create the universe. That's, that's pretty good. Okay? Divine power can sustain all the natural forces of the natural world. And it says in Colossians, he holds all things together by the word of his mouth. Divine power can heal the sick. We see that over and over. And then divine power can raise the dead. Jesus said this, all power in heaven and earth is given to me. Not some, not most, but I mean all. And in the Greek, all is a really cool word. Just, it simply means all. I mean, it's, it's, it's straightforward. Can you imagine, can you imagine having a battery that never goes out? Having a, a power source that never goes out? And here's the thing. God has invested in his power... God has invested his power in your spiritual growth. Think about that. God has invested his power in my spiritual growth. That's why Paul says this. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Why? Because it's not limited on Paul's power. It's totally dependent on what? God's power, which is unlimited. And that word strengthen means put his power into me. It means that's what it means, okay? So, it doesn't want to go. There we go. So, so like I said, I, I could give a whole, I mean, series of messages just on this verse 3. Um, and I'm not going to, but there are a few things that I want to say. What does it mean, okay, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness? Here's what it means in a nutshell. Christians can stop looking for something else, for something more. You have everything you need in what God provides. Okay? True believers in Christ can cease from, um, you know, beating themselves silly, self-flagellation, really, over um, past sins or present weaknesses. They can cease from seeking 
mystical experiences and special revelations. Okay, I, I, some of you guys know, Tuesday's my study day. I'll either go to Caribou or Mandy's, and I happened to be at Mandy's this past week, and there was four older people. They came in, and each of them came in carrying different books, and one was a Deepak Chopra book and something else, and there was all these kind of weird mystical books, and, and they just sat around there trying to figure out what book to read next. And, and man, some of the comments, I'm sitting there trying to study, and then all, there was comment after comment made where I'm just sitting there just going like, oh, you know, like I want to insert myself into the conversation, but I was like, man, if I do, I, I, I struggle because I'm like, Lord, should I? But I need to study. And so I'm like, no, I'm just going to keep going. And then something else would be said. And someone's like, oh, yeah, you know what? Well, there's this group and they're getting ready to start, you know, A Course in Miracles. And, and I thought I'd go check out that. And in case you don't know, A Course in Miracles is this weird new age, like mystical thing that Christians have no business messing around with. Like you don't need it. Okay. You have been in everything pertaining to life and godliness. It's not Jesus, hey, get a little bit of Jesus. And like these people talking about, well, you know, I, I like some of the things of Christianity, but I have a friend, and they're of the Hindu faith, and so they've been telling me about this. And then they're talking about like reincarnation and, you know, this comments made about, you know, that, that just was like, you know, oh, yeah, in your past life, if you, maybe you killed some, I mean, it was just all over the map. And I'm just sitting there just going like, oh, come on. As believers, we've been given everything pertaining to life and godliness. We don't need Jesus and. It's Jesus. It's his word. It's his spirit. It's his people. It's his church. Okay, We don't need anything else. And here's the truth for every Christian. Every person who has the Holy Spirit in them it's as a gift from Jesus. If you have Jesus, guess what? He's given you his Holy Spirit. Think about that. He's giving you, he's giving you the Holy Spirit. The third person of the Trinity resides within you. Now, I'm not making some weird new age thing like you are gods. Don't, that's not what I'm saying. Do not put words in my mouth. You know that's not what I'm saying. But you have the third person of the Trinity residing within you, leading you, guiding you, speaking to you, convicting you. And we all know, I think, that voice when it's like, no, I don't think you should do that. Like, like God wants to, to lead us, to guide us, and he wants to encourage us, and he wants to see us grow. God, by his divine power, that's resurrection power. It's the power that raised Jesus from the dead, and it keeps now every believer safe for eternity. By his divine power, that he has given to us, okay? He has given everything pertaining to life and godliness. And everything, in other words, everything pertaining to our salvation, everything pertaining to our sanctification. He has given us the divine life, and he's given us everything we need to continue in that process. We don't need to ask God for more. Now, we may need to submit more of ourselves to him, but he's already given us everything. Like, he's given us his son. He, like, there's nothing, you know, that he hasn't given us. Here's the thing. He's given us everything, and now we need to learn to appropriate it. And we're going to talk about that. Okay? We need to be obedient to his word and to his spirit. Now, look at, look at the wording of that verse. The only thing we need is a true knowledge of him who called us, because a true knowledge first brings life, then progressively brings sanctification. Now, it's not that we come to know him and thereby receive life and godliness. The term true knowledge, Peter's referring to that knowledge of him that's a result of our spiritual rebirth. That's why it's true knowledge. It's not some mentally assenting to the truth. It's a knowledge that only those who are spiritually alive can have. It isn't knowledge about him. It's knowledge of him. It's like I might say, I know my wife, or I know my father. And by giving us this life, okay, by bringing us into this knowledge of him, guess what? He's given us, he's lavished us, he's blessed us with everything we will ever need. Life to begin, okay, salvation, but then the power and the grace and everything else needed to carry it on to completion. So, you have to find in a building project the right investor. Guess what? He has to have power. Our investor does. What God expects you basically to take on or to attempt, 
He also enables you by his power. Here's the thing. God doesn't ask us ever to do anything that he doesn't give us the divine resources to do. I mean, that would just be weird. Hey, this is what I want for your life. <laughs> I know you can't do it, but I'm going to ask you to do it. Like, no, he asks us to do it. If we try to do it in our own strength, we will fail miserably. But when we, what, cast ourselves on his power, his resources, he enables us. He never asks us to do anything that he doesn't give us the resources to accomplish. Now, there's a second qualification, okay, of being the right investor. Promises. Our investor has made promises. Look at verse 4. By which we have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Now, if you're building a project and you have an investor, that investor's going to what? He's going to write the checks. Is he not? He's going to write the checks. Now, what is a check? Honestly, a check is just a promise. Think about that. A check is a promise. That's all they are. You can't do anything with that check until you go to the bank and what? Try to cash it. And a check has a person's name on it, fills in the amount, and it's tied to a bank account. It's no good until you cash the check. So money in the bank, that's power. Okay? The check that is written, those are the promises. Our God has the power, but he also has the promises. Here's the thing, though. A promise is only as good as the one who what? Makes the promise. Now, I could go down to my office and I grab my checkbook and I could write you a check for a million dollars. Here you go. And you could go, oh man, Pastor Mike gave me a million dollars. Now I gave you a check. <laughs> You're going to have an encounter problem when you show up to the bank and try to cash that. Especially if any of the people at Wells Fargo know, <laughs> we know that guy, there's no way. He's, like he doesn't have that kind of money. Now, I know some people that do, that could write a check for a million dollars and just, you know, give it to you. But if you're going to go cash it, okay, God has the power basically behind the promise. And guess what? God has promised that we can escape from our old life and go in a new direction. Isn't that the promise? Hey, I, I, I give you what? We call it eternal life. We call it new life, new birth. Here's your old life. Those that are getting baptized, it is a perfect description of, of, of everything we're talking about. When you go down in the water, that is your old self. That is your old life. It's this representation of the old life is what? Being buried. I'm dead to that. And then what? You're coming up, and it's the new birth. It's new life. And God has made that promise. Now, here's the thing. God makes lots of promises, but are we going to cash the check. You actually have to take that promise and say, I'm going to apply that promise to my life. That's cashing the check. Here's the thing. You can tell, I believe, how mature a Christian is by how that person treats God's word or treats God's promises. How did that person treat the promises of God? For example, someone who's living fearful, panicked, worried all the time, I believe it speaks volumes of one who maybe doesn't really know or believe God's promises. But a calm believer, someone who's confident, who's not panicking, who's not prone to worry, okay, they think this way. You know what? If God has written the check, I can cash it. If he says, hey, I'll never leave you, forsake you, I'll walk with you through this, all right, great. I'll take that promise to the bank. There's power behind the promise. If you're going to build anything of eternal value, you need the right investor. Our investor has power and promises, and they're great promises. He says here, what? Great and Precious promises. Isn't that amazing? I love that. Okay? They're from a great God, and they lead to a great life. And what is the promise, at least in part? He says that you should be partakers of what? The divine nature. Now, think about this. Okay? Like I said, I'm not making this some weird new age. Hey, you are becoming a God. That's not, that's not what he's saying. But... The life that you have in you right now as a born-again believer is the life of God. Okay? You are a partner with that life. And when you are born again, that's what happens. He places his Holy Spirit in you, and he, we, we use the word he regenerates. He, you, know, you are born again. Okay? And so the life of God now gets attached to your life. Now, here's what that 
means practically, okay? You can face your future with the kind of confidence that says, no matter what comes my way, God's power will be there. His promises will sustain me. His power will give me the ability to get through this, to meet all the hardships, the potential problems along the way. So you need the right investor. That's the first prerequisite. The second prerequisite to building a forever faith, okay, you got to follow the building code. You can't just, like, build, like, in any haphazard way that you want. I mean, there's building codes, and they have to be followed. Those of you that have worked on houses, right, like, you have to do things a certain way. And so God has outlined through Peter what that is, what that is to look like. Starting in verse 5, he says, okay, but for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge. To knowledge, self-control, to self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. Guys, ladies, gentlemen, this is your part. This is our part. Okay? God's part, we've already talked about. He's given us faith. He's saved us. He's made his promises. He's given us power. Those are the previous verses. God's given us the power and the promises. Now, this is our part. Now, some of you might be reading this critically, and in your mind, you're thinking, okay, and it's good to think critically, but you might be thinking, well, this seems paradoxical. What do you mean paradoxical? Well, you're telling me that God gives us everything that we need, right? But then, now you're saying, well, now add to that. How could you add anything to everything? And here's the answer that you need to understand, okay? Growth, spiritual growth, takes cooperation with God. I have to have, we have to have a cooperation with God's operation. I, you, me, we are to be involved in the process. Now, there are some people who just want it written this way, okay? Hey, God's given you everything you need Okay, to grow and be godly. Therefore, hey, you know what? Just let go and let God. How many times have we heard that? Just let go and let God. Like I'm just going to veg out in the spirit and just hope that, man, you know, over time I'm just going to become some super deep, mature, uh, solid Christian just because I'm just hanging out. I, I'm not doing anything. I'm just letting go and letting God. I'm telling you, it doesn't work that way. It takes cooperation. Look at the language. Peter says, Giving all diligence. When you hear that, giving all diligence, what do you think of? You guys can respond. What do you think of when you hear giving all diligence? What? Care? Okay, what else? Giving all diligence. Attentiveness. Efforts. Okay. The word, when that phrase, giving all diligence, literally means make every possible effort or to intensely exert yourself. Okay? Now, don't misunderstand me. We are not talking about salvation. We can't be talking about salvation. That is God. Like, there's nothing we can do, okay, salvation-wise. That's a gift from God. You are saved, we're saved by faith. It's a gift of God. That's verse 1 and 2. You've obtained like precious faith. You receive faith. That's a gift. But sanctification, this is our cooperation. This is teamwork with God. You don't just sit back and watch it happen. You're involved in the process. Spiritual growth is never accidental. It is always intentional. You want to, you know, know God's word better? Guess what? You have to spend time in it. There's a Bible app. Okay, you can download version. And there are, I mean, so many different ways that you can read through the Bible in a year. There's so many different Bible plans. I could never read the whole Bible. I could never read that thing in a year. Yeah, you can. It breaks down to, honestly, about three to four chapters a day. And you just have the app. I go through a different one every year. You know, sometimes it's in a different order or a different translation or whatever. Okay, but, but there's, there's intent. There's a purpose. It, it, it's intentional. And so... That's what we, it's not accidental. Now, Paul kind of writes the same thing. Some of you may know this, but in Philippians chapter 2, he says this, Therefore, brethren, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Does that ring a bell? You know that verse? Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now, has that ever puzzled you? Okay, work 
Without your own salvation? Okay, that verse, uh, it's later followed by this. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. It's the same thought, really, that Peter's getting at. God works in you. He gives you the power. He makes the promise, but you have to work that out. Maybe you're sitting here going, okay, I, I kind of get it, but still not fully getting how it works. Let me give you an example analogy, okay? A composer, someone who sits down and writes a musical score. He is going to provide the musicians everything that is needed, okay? He's writing the melody. He's writing the notes. He's writing down the timing, the cadence, you know, if it picks up, if it slows down. And he gives everything that's needed for that production, However, it takes a musician to sit down and work that out, okay, what he's laid out, and to play that score and to give what is written down a voice. Now, here's even another example to help you kind of wrap your brain around this. You go to the doctor, and the doctor says, you know what, um, I've examined you, <laughs> doesn't look good. You never want to go to the doctor and hear that, right? But um, here's the diagnosis, you need surgery, I'm going to perform the surgery, and then afterwards, I'm going to give you some medication that I need you to take post-op to help in the healing. So the doctor, he does it all, right? He does the surgery. I mean, you don't sit there, you're going under the knife, and the doctor's got the scalpel, and you're like, hey, give me a scalpel. You work on that side, doc, and I'll get this side. I mean, like, that, that doesn't work. You let the doctor do it all as far as the surgery, and then guess what? You listen to what he says to do post-op, and you cooperate with what he's done. The operation needs your cooperation to do the, maybe the rehab exercises or take the medication that's going to help in the healing. He does the operation, and then you, uh, you participate through the cooperation. So giving all diligence or making maximum effort, he says what? Add to your faith. And then he's going to give what I would call seven supplements, okay? Seven supplements. Um, Many of you in here, you take supplements, right? You have your food, but then you take what? Extra vitamin C, extra vitamin D, a whole bunch of other things to help you stay healthy because, I mean, we all know most of the food that we eat doesn't have everything that we need. I mean, it takes a lot of work to get that through food, and, and it costs a lot of money to do it, actually, as well. It, it's really cheap to eat poorly. So we take supplements, right, to help. Okay, If we're going to think about it in building terms, a building analogy, you have the building code, and then these are like, I don't want to say add-ons, but here's seven things I want you to add to the house that you are building. Okay, and they're going to supplement and make your house a killer house. So, yeah, I know you got to have a sink, but man, God's saying, I don't, I don't want you to put in, you know, just the, the cheap old, you know, metal sink. Let's put in the, the marble farm sink, okay? I, I know you need to cook your food, but like, let's not put in the little just you know, hot plates that, that you can just, you know, but let's put in like a Viking stove, right? Viking stove. All right, hey, we're not going to put, you know, Formica on the countertop. Let's put nice marble. Let, let, let's make this thing nice. We want this thing to last. So he's given us the power, and he makes the promises. Guess what? We cooperate and add the perks. Now, he's going to give you everything needed to pull that off. You don't have to manufacture and find that in and of yourself. Now, what are the supplements? Well, look at the first one that he lists here. He says virtue, right? For this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith what? Add virtue. Well, what does virtue mean? Virtue means moral excellence. Add that to your faith. Add moral excellence. One way to look at excellence is, is it something that fulfills the purpose for which it was made. And when you do that, you've added something special, some excellence to your faith. And then he goes on and he says what? Add to that knowledge. Now, this is a different word for knowledge that's commonly used um, in the New Testament. This word here is the word epignosis. It means an expert knowledge, a full knowledge. The ultimate knowledge. It's growing, it's personal, it's authentic, it's one that is also practical. And then he says after that, you're going to add self-control, add to knowledge, self-control. And sometimes there's a huge gap between um, our knowledge, what we know, and then what we do, right? Our actions. You know what's going to bridge that gap? Self-control. Add to what you know about God and know God with self-control. 
Now, self-control, it's a cool word, and I like to get into words sometimes, but it, it was a Greek word that means to hold oneself together. It speaks of an athlete who would say no to eating certain kinds of food and yes to certain kinds of training. Why? Because they wanted to win a race. Okay? The Olympics that were supposed to be last year, they're supposed to take place in a month in Japan. There's athletes from all over the world that have been training. They've been saying no to certain things so they could say yes to certain you know, training regimen. They've been saying no to certain foods. Why? Because they are saying yes to um, foods that are going to be better. It's self-control, discipline. And then what's next? Perseverance. That word perseverance we've talked about before, but it means, means to bear up under a trial or to bear up under a load. Okay, something, some hardship or, or difficult circumstance. It would be when you say to somebody, hey, man, you know what? I realize things are tough, but hang in there. <laughs> it's not always going to be this way. This is a season. God's going to get you through. Hang in there. And then he says what? Godliness. Literally, God-likeness. It's a word that speaks of being right with God and therefore, guess what? Right with people. When we're right with God, we can be right with people. When we're not right with God, we're often what? Not right with people. And vice versa. When we're not right with people, it's because like, those two axes need to be correct. So he says, and then what? Add to that brotherly kindness. That word? Philadelphia. I mean, isn't that cool? I mean, that city just has a cool name. Okay, brotherly love. And then he says, add to that brotherly love, okay, a higher kind of love, one that's higher than brotherly love, and that is the word agape. We've heard that word. It's the sacrificial love, okay, the love of the cross. It's, this, it's, it's that self-sacrificing kind of love. And those are really the seven supplements, the seven um, perks that we're going to add to that building. Now, I don't want you to think about that, that these are just like, well, I'm going to take some of those and, you know, and leave the rest. I mean, like, there's a progression to these things. One will lead to the other. If you have a faith that will produce a life of virtue, okay, if you have a moral excellent life, that's going to lead to knowing God better. And when you know God better, guess what? You're going to become more self-controlled. See, these things just like they, they, they land up. And when you're more self-controlled, you're going to be able to persevere under the hardships. And when you do that, guess what? You're going to become more godly. And then when you're more godly, you're going to care about your brother and sister. You're going to have that brotherly kind of love. And then guess what? The ultimate, you're going to have self-sacrificial love for people, that agape love. So get the right investor. Follow the building code. Here's a third prerequisite to building a forever faith. Build with growth in mind. Build with growth in mind. Hey, maybe you're sitting here thinking, you know what? I've been a Christian. I, I, I'm here, but I'm kind of on the sideline. I, I have believing faith, but like I, I, I'm listening to you, and it's like I want more. I want to add these things to my life. And here's the thing. You never stop growing. When you become a Christian, like you don't stop growing. It's not like, oh, hey, I'm saved. And you know what? Like, Oh, man, I, I added some virtue to my life. I added some self-control. No, no, no. We're continuously on the upward slope of growing until God, you know, calls us home or someone puts me six feet underground. Like, we're to be growing. We never stop. And look at it. That's what he says in verse 8. For if these things, what things? The things that he just listed are yours and abound... You will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the word abound means I have so much that it's overflowing. Okay? I keep getting it and it's overflowing. Any of you ever been to San Jose, California? Okay. I lived there for a little while. I got to intern for a neat pastor there. But there's a place called the Winchester Mystery House. Okay? And it was built by Sarah Winchester of Winchester rifle fame. She was told, she, she visited a medium, okay, a spiritist, and basically this medium said, if you keep building rooms onto your house, you'll never die. So as long as you keep building, you won't die. Well, she's dead, but the house remains. And here's the thing. There's some 160 rooms, and there's all these like stairways to 
you know, nowhere, and they, they go up to and you think it should go, and, like, you can go and tour this thing. It's really bizarre and really weird, but, you know, as long as I'm here, that was her thought, I'm going to keep building. That's what our goal as a Christian should be. As long as I'm here, I'm going to keep growing. I'm going to keep adding these things to my life, and I'm going to go deeper and deeper. I'm going to continue to cooperate. Guys, you don't come as a Christian get to the point where you're like, ah, you know what? I've got it all down, and I'm just going to what? Coast. I'm just going to go into neutral. Okay? We're going up a hill. What happens if you're going up a hill and you put the thing in neutral? I mean, you're not going to either, you're either going to step on the brake, right, and you're not going to go anywhere, but if you take your foot off the brake, what's going to happen? Okay, you're going to go backwards. We are to be going forward. That's the idea. Now, he says, if these things are yours and abound, that's the word overflow, you will neither, watch, be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus. When you build with growth in mind, you're going to be productive. You will never be barren. You know what that means? You will be fruitful. Your life will have impact. God will use your life to bring and be a blessing to those around you. Okay? There's people down there downstairs that are, that are pouring into your kids. They're, they're, they're bearing fruit. And, and there was lots of ladies that were here yesterday that helped pull um, the, this whole thing together. And I just sat back. I was kind of watching them just do all this stuff. It was beautiful to watch. But I don't want to be barren. I don't want my life to be unproductive. And so we're, we're to keep growing. So if you build with growth in mind, you will never be the kind of person that is barren and unfruitful. And have you ever met somebody who said, well, I, I gave that whole Jesus thing a try and it just didn't work for me. Have you ever heard anybody say that? I, I want to say, you know what? You gave Jesus a try, but you bailed. You, you, you didn't put in the effort. You didn't put in what you needed to put in because Jesus doesn't fail. You came to Jesus and you wanted him to do maybe this or that and he didn't you know, jump through your hoops, but it doesn't work that way. You don't put God through the hoops. He tells you what's going to happen, and you follow. So you'll never be barren. You won't be unfruitful. You will be um, somebody who bears fruit. It's one of those things that the New Testament speaks about. Jesus spoke about bearing fruit, and he said, you know how you bear fruit? Abide in me. Go read John 15. That's what the whole thing, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you want to be fruitful, you know, you will abide in me. He told it to his disciples, and guess what? Peter was there. Peter heard those words from Peter's, I mean, from, from Jesus' lips himself. Here's the secret to being fruitful. Abide in him. What does abide mean? Staying connected to. Okay? If the vine is connected to the tree, guess what? There's going to be nourishment that flows, and fruit is going to happen. And you never see, like, fruit. You're never walking by an orchard, okay, apple trees or orange grove, whatever, and, and hear the fruit, like, exerting a bunch of effort, do you? I mean, like, the apples, they're just like, come on. Like, no, he's just what? He's just hanging there. He's hanging out. He's connected to the source. We need to stay connected. So you can have faulty faith. You can have fake faith. Um, you can also have um, faith like, well, yeah, I believe in God. Like, like, but the Bible says even the demons believe, right? Now, we need genuine faith. We need fruitful faith. That's the picture here. You can have faulty faith or you can have fruitful faith. Now, you're going to be productive. Look at verse 9. He says, but he who lacks these things is short-sighted. You know, short-sighted, like, like they're very myopic. Like you can't see the big picture, right? Even to blindness. He has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. You ever met someone? It's like they say they believe, but then they're acting as if like they're, they're not a believer or they forgot what Jesus has done for them. That's what Peter's alluding to. They forgot that he was cleansed from his sins. Therefore, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure for if you do these things, what things? Okay. Be diligent to make your election calling sure. If you do these things and you're adding all these things to your faith, you'll never stumble. You ever seen like a little kid watch something that's scary and their reaction is what? <gasps> right? And they sometimes will close their eyes, they'll, they'll squint. 
Like, I, I love watching um, bizarre stuff on TV sometimes. Like, like, when they have, like, the full open heart surgery kind of stuff, and they're just showing, like, everything just kind of... I, I geek out. I love watching that. And my, my wife's kind of like, I don't need to see that. You know, and she'll make the... You know, uh, you know, you kind of squint. Can you imagine trying to, like, walk, you know, down the street, like, squinting? Like, you're probably at some point going to stumble. You're going to probably, st- you know, run into something. Um, we need to have eyes open. And so the, that's the picture Peter's painting. Someone trying to make progress while they're squinting. That's what he had described here, this person who is short-sighted even to blindness. Now, guess what? A growing believer is going to be a steady believer. That's a forever faith. He will never stumble. So you get the right investor, you follow the building code, and guess what? You build with growth in mind, and the last prerequisite here, plan for the move. Okay? You're building now, but you're building what? For the next place that you're going to be in. That's what he says in verse 11. He says, For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's where you're going. Don't forget that. That's where you're going. And so, yes, we're in this life and we're to be building our life, but we are planning for what? For what's ahead for the future. And he says an entrance will be supplied abundantly. Now, the Greeks used to use the term an abundant entrance to describe an Olympic athlete who won in the Olympics. And then he returned back home and there would be much fanfare. Okay? There would be this abundant entrance, and there would be people there, and they'd be cheering, and they'd be singing, and you know, there was just this whole celebration. It was an abundant welcome. I read about a man who decided to sail across the Atlantic Ocean. Now, lots of people have tried to sail across it, and they've done it, but um, what made it remarkable, he did it in the smallest boat ever to go across the Atlantic Ocean, 13 feet long. He sailed across. Can you imagine? I mean, that's like not much longer than a long surfboard. And, and he's in this thing, and he got, you know, bounced overboard several times. And, you know, sometimes the, the waves are so rough, and it was dangerous. I mean, he, like, literally tied himself with the rope so that, you know, he would stay to that little boat. And, and after 70, I think it's 78 or 76 days, finally he sees the shores, man, of, of England off in the distance. And you know what thoughts go in his mind? I can't wait to get out of this boat. I want just a hot meal. I want a shower. I want just to, you know, have a nice see. And he's just like ready to be done. But then guess what? There's all these people. There's like hundreds of boats out there. They they got in the news and they're waiting for him. And when he got to the shore, there's some thirty or forty thousand people waiting for this guy. That's an abundant welcome, right? I mean, at that moment, he's not thinking about all the times he was overboard, all the hardships, all that. All of that is, like, gone. He's just like, ah, guess what? That's what when we get to heaven it's going to be like, okay? When we get to heaven, we're not going to be sitting there. It's going to be so amazing. When we get there, we're not going to be going like, man, I can't believe I wasted all that time, God, studying your word and serving your people, going through those trials and those hardships. Like, we'll never, we won't be feeling that. We'll just be like, Oh, yes, this is amazing. That's what we want. And so we're to build and plan for the move, an abundant entrance. And guess what? The promise is, if you are in Christ, you will get there. It's not like, well, you might get there. No, if you stay connected, if you abide in him, you will get there. He has all the resources. He has all the power to make it happen. But we have to cooperate with him, right? You ever thought about this? Some will get more glorious entrance, um, get a more glorious entrance than others. What? Well, 1 Corinthians, okay, Paul says, there will be a time of testing at the judgment day to see what kind of work basically each builder has done. Some will receive a reward. That's an abundant entrance. You're going to receive a reward upon entering. And then it says, others will be saved, but like somebody escaping basically through a wall of flames. How are you going to arrive? Are you going to arrive with an abundant welcome where people are like, oh, yeah, and you hear what? Well done, good and faithful servant. It's our joy to have you here, man. Or are you going to be that person like, you know, you get to heaven, people are like, whoo, man, it's amazing you made it. We were wondering. Peter and Paul, man, they were making bets to see if you were going to get here. Okay, I say that in jest. 
But what kind of entrance are we going to have? Okay? What rewards are we going to be given? Guess what? The gains of heaven will far outweigh any losses that you might experience here. Now, I'm not saying anything to minimize loss. Like, loss is difficult. And I know some of you have have gone through loss recently. And guess what? We're all going to go through loss. But the rewards of heaven, the rewards that Jesus is going to give, far outweigh anything that we could lose in this life. Now, getting back to that Leaning Tower of Pisa, remember I told you it was going to fall. They moved it back, actually, to its 1838 position. They predicted, well, in 2300, it might come down. So uh, we have time. You can can go visit and probably not have to worry. Now, I just wonder if those who built it researched what the name Pisa means in its origin. You know what the name Pisa means? The word Pisa means marshy ground. The Leaning Tower of Marshy Ground. If you build on marshy ground, guess what? Things are going to lean and eventually topple. I mean, it it goes with what Jesus said. Build on what? A solid, firm foundation. On Christ the solid rock I stand, what? All other ground is sinking sand. You know the song. So make sure that our life is built on the right foundation. God gives us the gift of salvation. He he gives us that. And then he says, you know what? I have power. I have precious promises. And I want you to appropriate them. I want you to put them into your life, to add these things to your life. You're not, like you've already been given salvation, but now we cooperate with his operation, his rescue operation of salvation. We cooperate. And guess what? Spiritual growth happens. Don't you want to grow? I want to grow. I want to be further along the road this time next year than I am right now. That should be all of our goal. We don't want to just be in the same. We want growth. I mean, imagine your child, okay, just stays in that state. And and we know that there's certain things that can happen to a child where they do that. They, They don't mature. They don't grow. But the the goal, really, of every parent is to see that child grow, to learn skills, to be productive, to be kind, to to be pursuing God, and to, you know, just have a life that's meaningful. That's that's the aim. That's that's God's same aim for us. He wants us to grow. Are we going to cooperate? 